whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you go all caps blazing into the comment section like I know you want to, I want to start off by pointing out the fact that I did not make this list. I didn't write it. Michael Hamplet did. And I've seen all the horrible comments on his whatculture.com article, and I don't want that hate coming my way online. I get more than enough. So if you want to send it to Michael Hamplet, his Twitter handle is at well, Michael... Whoa, 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 whoa. I wrote it, but I didn't come up with all the ideas. Oh, it's right. Some forums. Some wrestling forums. Okay, what are they saying? Jesus Christ, are you allowed to say that? Well... Well, okay, well, at least we've established these views aren't ours. No, well, but don't matter. Uh, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, and these are the 10 worst simultaneous WWE heavyweight champions. Right, what have you got for number 10? Oh, for f Number 10, Kofi Kingston and Seth Rollins, 2019. Kofi Kingston and Seth Rollins are, as per the aforementioned forum posts, <clears throat> dog sh The same poster notes that... Seeing Seth and Kofi as champions is making WWE feel more like a high school indie company than ever before. Both champions are horrifyingly bad, awful in every single way imaginable. Now, whilst that is obviously bollocks, the title wins were arguably more important than the reigns, especially when early indications suggest they'll always be in the shadow of the Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, superhero villain archetype, Vince McMahon will not never abandon. The jury's out, but the charge regrettably isn't as baseless as it may first appear. Number 9. CM Punk and Sheamus 2012 In stark contrast to the catharsis of Kofi Kingston and Seth Rollins top in the card, mid-2012's version of CM Punk and Sheamus were babyfaces the audiences could have adored had they not been given reasons to rapidly lose faith quicker than a What Culture video featuring me rather than Simon Miller. CM Punk's needlessly complicated program with Chris Jericho had made a sports entertainment oaf out of the voice of the voiceless. A disappointing WrestleMania match that had initially been focused on just who exactly was the best in the world eventually delivered the answer. Neither of them. And then we come to my long-lost brother, Seamus. Saying it before you have the chance to. Audiences couldn't forgive or forget the booking of the infamous 18-second switch against Daniel Bryan at the show of shows, and subsequently vented their frustration in scuffles between the Yes Man and the Great White. Ooh. Number 8. The Big Show and Shawn Michaels, 2002. The goodwill felt almost entirely isolated to the hallowed halls of MSG when Shawn Michaels unexpectedly scooped a final world title win in the second of his two impactful 2002 return efforts at November's Survivor Series. It was easy to be cynical, despite these strong showings, Michaels' comeback wasn't yet fleshed out as the real deal, and the glad handing of Raw's top prize between Triple H and his best buddy at the expense of a roster the game had started to systematically destroy at that time, oh, more on that later, overpowered their program in the end. SmackDown was at least a welcome distraction to some of the nonsense on Raw. I mean, who remembers this crap? Astutely penned by Paul Heyman and his team, the blue brand offered up slabs of banter so broad that Vince McMahon was too heart-eyed to notice the quality pro wrestling taking place elsewhere under his banner. Brock Lesnar was front and center of the uprising, but his undefeated streak's termination at the typewriter hands of the big show felt entirely unearned. What year is it? Number seven, Alexa Bliss and Carmella. 2018. Great on their own terms, neither Alexa Bliss nor Carmella needed each other to be the other show's champion during their divisive reigns with the respective women's titles. Not least after bad booking and Vince McMahon living down to expectations had failed them both. Where have I heard that before? Alexa Bliss was scripted to bully and abuse Nia Jax in the run-up to the extended kicking she took at WrestleMania, but won the feud two months later after using a Money in the Bank briefcase she scooped earlier that night to batter the irresistible force and baddest woman on the planet, Ronda Rousey, during their own spirited scrap. Don't be a bully. Be a champ, kids! Meanwhile, Carmella's cash-in on Charlotte was intentionally cheap, but her victory over the Queen was disconcertingly dominant, as were her ill-gotten victories over the newly idiotic Asuka in the months that followed. The Princess of Staten Island wasn't crafted to become credible, but her opponents were still suffocating under the strain of her reign. Oh, and they were both blonde, which obviously helps. 
Number 6. AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar, 2018 There are times in wrestling when, for reasons it seems hard to pass in hindsight, the product suffers despite the best intentions of all involved. Such was the case in autumn 2018, after Brock Lesnar was infuriatingly selected to take back the Universal title after Roman Reigns' devastating departure. The Beast took the red belt back at Crown Jewel, a pay-per-view so abysmal it really set the standard for modern era bollocks. I'm not even mad. That's that's almost impressive. Styles, meanwhile, had held the title for nearly a year at this point, but like the sagging series with Joe, his multi-show programs with Shinsuke Nakamura, Sami Zayn, and Kevin Owens had woefully underperformed. On paper, these two were phenomenal. In practice, <sighs> number five, Jinder Mahal and Brock Lesnar. 2017. AJ Styles was hailed as something of a saviour throughout October and November 2017. He flew from Chile to Minnesota to help out <clears throat> and substantially improve a Tables, Ladders and Chairs pay-per-view, you know, the one where Angle cosplayed as a S.H.I.E.L.D. member with a firecracker of a clash against Finn Balor. And then Styles travelled to a Manchester Smackdown Live taping to relieve the dreadful Jinder Mahal of the WWE Championship to not only set up a fantasy battle with Brock Lesnar, but remove entirely the prospect of the Beast's planned mutilation of the modern-day Maharaja. Thank God. The summer of 2017 was perhaps the most depressing in recent headliner history for WWE. Jinder cracked wise and incredibly bloody stupid with Shinsuke Nakamura on Tuesdays. Look at him. Oh, hasn't he got a silly face? Whilst Brock went back to uh, not really turning up, as his maiden run with the red belt ran on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Lesnar, immovable as the part-time solution to the company's biggest problem in decades, was set to square off with the experiment gone wrong, Mahal, before Styles swooped in and took the title with just a week to spare. Whew. Number 4. JBL and Triple H, 2004 2004 Triple H was as entrenched in his reign of terror then as he was during any point between his 2002 heel turn and 2005 trifecta of losses to Batista. Loathsome for better and worse on the blue brand, JBL was a complete git as the heel steward of SmackDown, though his reign begged for a baby face of similar stature to bring him down from his unearned perch. John Cena answering that call on the night Big Day first flattened the game, helped WWE draw one of their biggest ever buy rates. So perhaps both of these boring bastards were objectively successful after all. But try watching the weekly products they presided over on the WWE Network. It is torturous and I'd know about that, having to work in an office with jewels every day. Ordinarily in wrestling, the end justifies the means. But never before had a traditionally babyface promotion relied so heavily on horrid, horrid heels. Number three, John Cena and Alberto Del Rio, 2013. Alberto Del Rio's 2013 heel turn wasn't unwelcome, but the match that triggered the switch unfortunately returned the World Heavyweight title to his possession long after he'd proved himself unable to carry the load. Reclaiming it from Dolph Ziggler after concussion issues knackered the show-off's only proper stint with the strap, Del Rio was no more or less over as a heel, but at least he got to use his smug expression for evil rather than good, I suppose. Not like anything mattered anyway after one of the worst versions of John Cena took back over. His three-year arc with The Rock concluded with Big Match John becoming the champ yet again, more confident than ever before. Oh, good. Dishwater dull dalliances with Ryback in the post-WrestleMania slump foreshadowed the frustrating reliance WWE still had on old habits too. Speaking of which, number two, Randy Orton and John Cena, 2013. <sighs> Really, WWE? For two men relentlessly pushed and protected over a decade that became preserved in sodding nectar in their latter years, the champ and the viper were never the icon the organization desperately wanted them to be. This isn't a subjective take from a Generation Y fan gifted the likes of Hogan Warrior and Austin Rock in his formative years. Know that, and take that bloody image of me down. Look. 
their Royal Rumble 2011 stare down two bloody years before this supposed scorched earth decider presented deafeningly silent evidence about audience disinterest. And all before Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan. This guy. This guy. This guy, the Daniel Bryan, John Cena handpicked as his SummerSlam opponent just four months earlier that had, in the wake of winning that exact match, become the biggest star in the world. The Daniel Bryan John Cena had to park an infamous go-home segment with the Apex Predator 4 to acknowledge due to the voluminous support from the live crowd. The Daniel Bryan that lost a handicap match on the show Orton and Cena were set to headline over who was the true champion. Yeah, that guy wouldn't be crowned for months. I really hate you sometimes, Vince. Number one, Sheamus and Kane 2010. The absolute state of your 2010, WWE. Have a word with yourself. Sheamus and Kane were beneficiaries of the champ being otherwise engaged with my best friend Wade Barrett's crew of losers for much of the summer, rather than programs with challengers that justified their continued dominance on either brand. The Big Red Machine in particular lasted far too long on fumes. His reignited feud with The Undertaker barely caught fire at all, save for some absurd twists in the middle involving Paul Bearer. Where once mythology had come to life in a genuine money-drawing sports entertainment spectacle, the pair had exposed how every trick was ever played through their advancing years and lack of creative spark. This time, the urn has a torch in it. That same lack of spark had long rendered Sheamus's first main event push more pointless than Andy Murray's comb. His second title reign in a difficult first year began with a fluke and culminated in a turgid three-match series with Randy Orton that ended in defeats as boring as any of the tainted victories. Randy Orton's win didn't salvage a lost year either. A cash-in loss to The Miz was the first breath of fresh air the Bell had experienced all year. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And you can check out some more of our recent videos here. And check out our podcast by searching for What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes or Spotify. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam from What Culture, and I'll see you soon.